G'day folks, Troy Dean here and welcome to another episode of the WP Elevation Podcast. This is our first episode in our brand new video studio and our guinea pig test guest this week is my good friend all the way from Western Australia, Kim Barrett from Your Social Voice. Hey Kim, how you doing? I'm doing phenomenal. Thank you so much for testing on me. I love it. It's a beautiful place. Thank you so much for being the first guest in here, man. Help us christen it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so for those that don't know, tell us a little bit about who Kim Barrett is, what do you do and why are you here? Yeah, beautiful. So um, Kim, technically speaking, there's a whole other story we can go into, but I'm actually Lord Kim Barrett. I'm a Lord of Scotland. Really? Yes. Oh, well, uh, it's a whole rabbit hole. We'll go down another time. But <laughs> that's my, uh, so when people say who I am, uh, I'm officially a Lord of Scotland. Um, but yeah, so like I do Facebook ads for people. We really help businesses grow by focusing on their leads and their sales when it comes to Facebook and Instagram paid advertising. Uh, we don't touch anything outside of that. That's really our wheelhouse. And we just want to focus on helping businesses grow by really diving into those two key areas and making sure that they have that covered and 100% knocked on the head because uh, that's the big one of the biggest problems we see for people is like they may have a great product but if they don't know how to tell people about that product then they're not gonna have a good time mm. um, I want to I do want to get to this point where you're in business and you're helping other business owners with leads and sales but I want to take a little bit of a step back how, how deep is the Lord Kim Barrett rabbit hole can you give us the too long didn't read version yeah yeah uh, so essentially we're talking about how can you get upgrades when you go on flights hotels and stuff and I was like read this article and it was like Basically, if you're a doctor, a lord, a s official sir, you're gonna get preferential treatment. And then we we're sitting around a table at an event one time and then they were like, I'm pretty sure you can buy a lordship online. Huh. And I was like, yeah. And they'll Google it and it was like, yeah, lordship. And it was like 69 bucks. And I was like, if, if and we were at an uh, event where it was like all inclusive, so we didn't have a wallet. So I was like, if I can buy this on PayPal right now, guys, I'm gonna become a lord of Scotland. <laughs> and I clicked and it was like, PayPal. I was like, done. <laughs> official lord of uh, Glencoe in Scotland. So I own probably, this much of a, of a square foot of land in Scotland somewhere. Unreal. And uh, that gives you the Lord title. So they sent you all the documentation and all the all the stuff. So wow. yeah, I've got to, so every time I check into a hotel, it's like, just look up Lord, Lord Kim, Kim Barrett. Barrett. And then they're like, <laughs> oh yes, of course, of course. Yeah. Fantastic. Does it help with the business class upgrades? Uh, business class upgrades, planes are very difficult. So yeah, not really, but uh, definitely at hotels, especially when you're traveling like in Canada and the US and you check yeah. in and cause they like, they can't pick the accent. They're like, are you Australian or English? Not quite sure. And then they're just like, of course, of course, Lord. Yes. International yeah. man of mystery, Lord yeah. Kimberley. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so let's just wind back a little bit. You grew up in Perth in Western yep. Australia. Yep. Yeah. And just paint the picture for those that don't, I mean, I know what Perth's like. I've got really good friends live there. I've spent a fair bit of time there, but for those that have never been to Perth, just give us a little bit of a, a picture of what growing up in Perth is like. Well, Perth is the most isolated capital city in the world. So it's mm. very much, I liken it to, especially for any Australians or uh, really wherever you're from, it's a big country town. Mm. Um, that's what it's always like, very heavy beach lifestyle, um, close to the coast, everyone lives there, no one really lives inland, it's all about that. So um, it's very much like community-based, uh, beach-based, and just, you know, no one's ever working there too hard. It's pretty, yeah, yeah. pretty laid back and relaxed, yeah. I always like to say. Were you a surfer? Uh, I wish I was a surfer. The first time I ever surfed was actually in Hawaii. The guy's like, you're from Australia yeah, and, I, yeah. and from Perth. And I'm like, yeah, I just never did. I, I love going to the beach and swimming, but yeah, yeah. I, not that coordinated, yeah. unfortunately. And that Western Australian coastline is one of the largest coastlines in the world. In fact, I think mm. California is the largest single coastline in the world. And I think Western Australia might be the second. Yeah. And those beaches are just unbelievable oh, and beautiful. infested with sharks. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't ever have one just, you can't just have a good thing, right? There's always got to be the little risk on the side and then you go north and it's like, cool, and then there's crocodiles. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah, yeah it's like you choose. It's like, I'd rather the shark than the crocodile, yeah. <laughs> so at what point, growing up in Perth, at what point did the idea of um, being an entrepreneur or having some kind of business interest, how young were you when that started to come into your mind? Pretty young. Like I always say to people when they were like, when you were a little kid and they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? For some reason, I always had businessman. I just imagined mm. myself flying on planes with like a briefcase and, I, and um, I thought that would be really cool. So I'd always thought about that. So even when I was young, I was always trying to come up with, and my dad was very much, and apparently my granddad as well, um, were all very much like opportunists, like trying to see and create ideas. So my granddad used to work for Qantas. He was an engineer, so he would fly to places like Mauritius and come back to Australia. So he would try and like import like plants and things and bring them back to Australia to sell and then pass down to my dad and then I suppose to me as well. So even when I was a little kid, um, uh, do you remember Pokemon, the game? Yeah, yeah. And three and a half inch floppies. So I found out yeah. a way to download Pokemon 
onto three and a half inch floppies and then I'd take them to school and sell them for like two bucks a pop <laughs> and they were like 50 cents. So I was like making a dollar fifty profit every one. I was like, this is great. And I was like, why isn't anyone else doing that? And then I found out a week later when I got pulled up by the principal that it's probably not a good idea to, yeah. to do that. But Kind um, of infringing some yeah. copyright laws maybe. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. But uh, if Pokemon, if you're listening, please don't. Uh, <laughs> please don't sue me. <laughs> and, um, and so you go through school. Um, did you do the traditional kind of go to university and get a degree? Did you do that whole journey? Yeah, well, because I, 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 even though I was doing little businesses on the side all the way along and just making different ways to try and make money and create businesses, I still thought, cool, I've got to go to university and then I'm going to go into a big company because because I still had that, that's how I was gonna become like the businessman with the briefcase, mm -hmm. was go in, so I did international uh, marketing and management, mm -hmm. did all of that, went through, and then I was like, cool, now I've got a degree. Surely I'm gonna get a really, it's gonna be easy for me to get a job. And I worked while I was at uni as well, so I didn't just not have any experience. And then I started applying for graduate roles, and then they're like, cool, but what about your experience? I was like, well, isn't this how I get the experience? Mm -hmm. By doing this? And then they're like, yeah, but you don't have any experience yet. And I was like, but you have to give me the opportunity to get experience. Like, how is it going to work otherwise? Yeah. And that, I got frustrated with that very quickly. So I quickly, like, almost flushed my degree down the toilet in the sense that I was like, well, I'm, I'm not getting anywhere with this. Mm. So I was working at an accounting firm at the time. So I went and then worked at an IT company and then at a grain trading company. But I just got really bored. Like, there was nothing there to stimulate me. Mm. And I was very, and luckily when I first started working at an accounting firm, they like that was like we had to time bill every six minute increments mm. and you had to be accountable for your whole day mm. so now my staff are like oh you have to fill in like you have to time track and i'm like yeah i had to time track six minute increments and that yeah. had to be billed to customers yeah so that made me very efficient in working and both the jobs that i went to one job this the one just before i started my own business i actually was doing what their previous staff member was doing in a week and two days wow and then I was like, what else can I do? And then he's like, well, you just got to wait in case we get orders. So I was like, okay, cool. That's when I just started like researching, like how, literally, how can I make money online while I'm at work was my side, question. My side question. hustling. Yeah. yeah. How, how long were you at uni? How long did the degree take? Uh, it was a three-year degree. I did it in three and a half, I think, because I took one semester. I only did like a couple of units because I was working full-time as well the whole time. And in Australia, we have the... Um luxury of, of basically going to university. It doesn't cost us anything up front, but we mm. incur what's called a hex debt or a help debt to yeah. the government. So you do three and a half years at uni, you've got this huge debt you've got to pay back to the government. You're going for jobs and they're saying, but what about your experience? Yeah. And you've and this is just completely broken that education model, isn't it? Yeah, and like I even went to and they like they they told me you should go and work in business. I was like, cool, I'm working full time in an accounting firm. Surely that will stand for something. And then it's like, well, no, you now want to go into management consulting. Uh, where's your management consulting experience? I'm like, well, I worked full time and studied. Surely that's got to help. Count no. for something, yeah. No, I didn't get anything. So what was the first business that you started of your own? First proper business um, was selling cologne huh. yeah so i always thought because i do bunnings yeah, yeah yeah exactly so i always was because i was working in an accounting firm at the time and i was like well i can get abn i can register it myself I used to register companies trust super funds mm. so when i was doing that i was like if i get abn surely i can just go and get wholesale prices from all these other um, places so at the time it's like when I was like was I was like 19 it's like everyone would always be like yeah cool well, you've got the new like Jean Paul spray or whatever it is and it smells really nice and whatnot so I was like cool well there's surely got to be a wholesaler over this so I found a wholesaler registered an ABN because I was working there and then I was like can't, it was and it was sense of smell with so s-c-e-n-t-s -E sense mm -hmm. of smell I thought it was a good play on words um, so then I started buying that and I was like well all the girls in the office, I sold all of them perfume. Then I started all my sister's friends, posts on Facebook, and I was like, who wants cheap spray? Uh, cologne, and everyone was like, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we want this, we want the new Britney Spears smell, or whatever it was from my sister's friends, they were a couple years younger. But then I was like, oh, cool, then next month, I'm like, cool, you guys want some more? They're like, no, we still have a whole bottle, and I was like, Oh, this is probably not a very good business mm. model because like all the people I know are going to buy one bottle mm. and that's going to last them six months. Yeah. Like I, I'm not, not going to get much repeat business here. Mm. So that slowly after a couple of months, I'll say, oh, this is this is not good. I'm not going to get very far here. So at some point, it sounds to me like you realise that working in a traditional inv corporate environment, you mm. were going to be either bored or you weren't going to be challenged enough. Yeah. There's a big, there's a big mind, there's a big gap between that and actually starting your own thing. Mm. Right? Most people 
just can't make the mental leap to start their own thing. Yeah. What do you think it is about your upbringing or the people that were around you in your life at that time that enabled you to take the risk and make that leap and and think, well, if it doesn't work, that's okay because I can always try something else. Because, I mean, we were at an event last night with Marie Folio and she was talking about this a lot, that mm. fear just stops people making the first step. So fear would stop people from registering an ABN and trying to buy a cologne from a wholesaler and sell it on Facebook. Most people just wouldn't do that because they would be afraid of either, you know, feeling like an imposter or no one's gonna take me seriously or what if it fails, I'm gonna be embarrassed, what do I do then? Yeah. But it sounds like that you had some kind of will or some kind of desire to just keep going regardless of the failures. Can you just talk about how that mindset came about or was that just a natural part of your DNA? I think it was a little bit of a natural part, but I also, it's like, whenever I looked at anything, I was like, well, logically, I, I'm very logically brained. So it's like, cool, if I go and do this, and to be honest, everything I was doing was just pu purely selfish at this time. Cause it's mm. like, well, I wouldn't get a discount on this stuff. Mm. So if I do it, and then if I can make money, then it's like, I'm always also good, I think, at seeing opportunity in something and going, well, there was no risk. Cause it's like, I'm just gonna get cheap like spray right now. Mm. And then from there, if other people want it, like, if they say no, that's cool. That's cool. I only want it for myself. And there was the same, like my brother and I also started a supplement company called K-Boss Fitness. And it was the same thing. We like, I was like, well, if it worked with that, and now we're both like fitness and my brother was like wanting to go to bodybuilding competitions and buy lots of protein and stuff. I was like, if we can get our protein cheap for us, it's a win. And then I was like, and then if other people want it, like that's cool. They can have it if they want it, but like we're going to get it for ourselves anyway. So it was kind of selfish. So for me, it was really risk free and there was no fear because it's like, I'm doing something for me. Mm. And then if other people, if I can it, like make, then make it cover its own cost or, you know, like I can sell a few extra bags and that buys me my bag then of protein. It's like, I'm, I'm happy with that. Mm. So it was always just kind of like, I was actually, as opposed to being scared, I was actually trying to mitigate my own risk mm. by going, well, if I can do this and I sell a few to others, then I'll get my stuff for free mm. and they can pay the pay the cost to cover it. So for that side of things, I think it was really down to that. Um, but then like before, but then to make me actually choose to go and back myself into a job was actually because I was just really annoyed mm. and I was frustrated because what happened was when I was working, um, so in, uh, especially in Australia, pretty much we've got the Christmas break and it's shut down. Like mm. everything shut down. That's when I go spend time with my grandparents, the whole family, like that's mm. really family time in mm. like my history and, and household. So we, I was working at a job where we were selling to places all over the world, Malaysia, China, et cetera. They didn't celebrate Christmas. Mm. So they had orders coming in and the boss was like, you have to work now. And I was like, but this is, like, this is family time. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but we're only closed on the public holidays. So on the 27th, the 28th, 29th, like all the days, like we're, we're open and I'm going to be away on holidays. So, so I need you, you to work. Yeah. So you have to cover in case orders come in. And I was like, that sucks. Yeah. And so I think it was like, then on the 1st of January, it was like my resignation was in from that because it was just like, well, you can't, I don't want someone to tell me when I can and can't yeah. spend time with my family. So that was like, what like kind of pushed me over the edge. Yep. And it's not that my boss was bad in any way, mm. but it's like, it was a business decision. He's like, well, we've got to be open. This year I'm going to be away. Next year I might be back, so then you can have it off. But I was mm. like, I don't really want to have that as, and same for us as a business model now, we're like closed and we have skeleton crew on for Christmas because I yeah. love that time of year. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, everyone, you have two weeks off, let's do it then and then yeah. get it done for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So, so was it like wanting more control over your time yeah. and more freedom to do what you wanted to do with your time? Exactly. And, yeah. that, and that's really what pushed me over because it wasn't that like, and it was probably a stupid time to do it. Cause mm. I only had one client paying me 200 bucks a week mm. when I quit and I went from like a 75 grand a year job mm. and I was like, okay, I'm going to quit now because this is frustrating me. And then next week it's like, Kim, you still have $50,000 a year of expenses that you were spending because of that car rent, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, uh, that's, and I was like, and then I was like, oh, I'm not really don't want to go back and be like, I can come back and help a little bit if you want. Tail between your legs. Yeah. So I was like, okay, so now I've got to try and figure out what to do. Yeah, make so it was, work. Yeah. So it was like, again, it was, uh, there was, there was, there was fear amongst them. It was more probably pig headedness being like, you can't tell me what to do. Mm. And then quit and take and took Burn action because of that. Yeah. You get you got to figure it out. And then I had to figure it out. I was like, oh. Again, but like if anyone's watching or listening, it's like I probably wouldn't recommend. Like, don't do it that way. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. that's a bad way to do it. Yeah, yeah. How old were you at this point when you when you quit full time work and decided to go all in? Twenty five. Okay. Yeah. So that's still pretty young in terms of life experience. Mm. Um, 
Uh, are you generally a burn the ships kind of dude? Like I'm totally a burn the ships dude. Like I put myself in a corner, burn the ships and just fight my way out. That's when I perform the best. If, if there's a safety net, I'm just not gonna take the risks or stretch myself to do it. So is, is that like now you're a little bit older, a little bit more mature, made some mistakes, learned a bunch of stuff. Are you still a burn the ships kind of guy or are you, do you hedge your bets a bit more? Uh, I, uh, well, that's why I have a team now. Mm. is so that they can help me hedge the fence a little bit. Because sometimes I'll do stuff and I'm like, yes, this. Yeah. And then they're like, but what about all these things? And yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh, mm. okay, fine. All right, well, let's dial that back in a little bit and, and adjust. But then I can find also in certain circumstances, like on from short term, I'm like that. But long term, I'm probably more conservative. Mm. So now I've got a few people on our team which are real big thinkers. And they're like, oh, cool. What about this, this, and this? And I'm like... Oh well, wow! That's like that's that's stretching me uh, like too far, mm. and then I'm like, let's just focus on like the next six months rather than like this five year grandiose uh, plan to be you know like ten twenty million dollar a year company. Mm. That then like freaks me out on the opposite scale. But on the short term horizon, I'm very much the like, oh, let's just get let's that do done. And yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no plan B. Yeah, and so now you've got a team of of eight in Perth. Is that right? Yeah, team of eight. Um, wh- how I'm curious about the conversations that you have in your head. Mm when you go to hire someone, how do you, there's all, I mean, I know we've, we're building a team here at the moment. We've got six here in Melbourne. We're about to hire a project manager. We've got six in the Philippines. We've got one of the Gold Coast, my business partner in Sydney, three coaches in the States. Every time we bring someone on, there's a mental, not barrier, but there's a mental conversation I have to have with myself about, you know, cash flow and growth and bringing in sales and can we sustain it and how's it going to impact the business and how's people roles going to change and how they're going to fit from a cultural point of view. And then sometimes they just don't turn up for interviews like this morning. <laughs> um, so instant fail. Um, what, what challenges or what conversations do you have in your mind when you think about bringing a new team member on? And, and I do specifically want to talk about the general manager role too, because now you've got someone basically running the business while you're away. So mm. how, how does that conversation roll out in your head? Well, it's always for me just looking at going, okay, cool. Like it, who's, is this going to make someone's life easier? Because if you can make our life easier and free up capacity, like so every day we have a morning huddle, like the whole team, we stand together and we always get everyone to identify it. And um, a guy told me this age ago and it just stuck with me. He's like, uh, like imagine if you're doing a bench press. Mm. And he's like, and if you've got too much weight on there, that's like 10 out of 10, you're way overloaded and you can't get the bar up. Mm. And it's like anything under that, you can get through it, but it might be a little bit hard. So every day we get everyone's team's capacity most of the days they're eight, nine, some days it might be a 10 and we help out. And when they get too close to that 10 level every every couple of, like every week, mm-hmm. then I'm like, okay, I need to bring in someone to help alleviate some of this. Mm. And then again, this is where I'm probably more uh, short term focused because I go, cool. Well, even though I might be bringing on someone for like 50 or 75 grand a year, I'm like, but that's only like an extra 800 to a thousand bucks a week out of the cash flow. I'm like, yeah, we can manage that for like three months. That's not a problem. And then it's like, I don't really think, I, again, probably only short sighted. I'm like, I don't really see how that's going to affect us in the whole year. I go, but we can we can test that out for this period. Mm. And I'm willing to invest that because I know I can always go make more sales, bring in more clients and customers to allow mm. us to kind of alleviate that cash flow. Mm. But it's like, do we have the immediate funds to be able to test this for mm. whatever it might be, like 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Yeah. And if we do, then I'll, I'll kind of roll the dice a little bit but only if I think that they're going to be a good fit. So sometimes we'll go for it and we'll put a job up and we'll try and get applicants and they all come back and none of them are good. And I'm like, oh, guys, can, can everyone like just contribute an extra couple of hours for this month and get through this period and see if we still need someone? Mm. Um, because I'm much, I care much more about the impact they're going to have on our cultural totally. impact yeah, yeah. than anything else. Because I've seen businesses, been in businesses where lots of people have come in mm. and I'm like, oh, but now it's like, there's now there's the caddy corner and the yeah. girls are talking about these guys and yeah. this is happening. And it's like, I don't ever want to have that there. I want everyone to be on the same same page, totally. same team. Yeah, and you want your workspace to be a dickhead free zone, right? Yes, Yeah. Introduce 100%. one dickhead and it just spreads like cancer, that toxicity. Yeah, exactly. I want to just wind back a little bit because you said, I know that I can just go make more sales and bring more clients in. Mm. Now, let's just park here for a second because that's a huge, like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about that, right? Most people that I've, I would say the majority of people that I've worked with over the years in a coaching or consulting capacity don't have that belief. Mm. They, They get scared about hiring someone. So what they do is they, they will either do it themselves or it just won't get done and that they won't take the business to the next level because they're afraid if they bring someone in, they won't be able to generate enough revenue to pay that person's wages, right? Yeah. So how do you know that you can just go get more, make more sales and bring more clients in? Like 
that's something that you just don't wake up and go, well, I can just go sell more shit to people and pay for things. Yeah. That comes <laughs> yeah. from experience and from, and from knowing that you can do it. How, 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 how has that belief evolved in you over the years? Look, I, probably at the very beginning of my business, if you asked me that, I probably wouldn't say that. Of course. I'd definitely not. I'd be like, oh, that's freaky, right? It's yeah. like, oh my God, like I've got you know, four grand outstanding on my credit card and yeah. you want me to do this? But n- because we've had to grow our business and probably as a byproduct of not really having much and being in Perth as well, it's like we didn't really have huge amounts of support around us or anything like that. And as well, I was a 20, 5, 26, starting the business, like, I didn't want, to be honest, I'm te- I'll be the technical, like, introvert, mm-hmm. right? So it's like, I don't like going to network, and like, just go to a networking event and meet people and mm-hmm. then get referrals, and I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Like, yeah. I'd rather, like, now it's like, even then still, like, get me, I'll talk in front of everyone, not yeah. a problem. But if yeah. you want me to go then, go network with every single person, it's yeah. like, no, I'm gonna be dead the next day, so yeah. no, thank you. So we had to get really good as a byproduct of our business as well at running Facebook ads. So mm-hmm. I just, I, after like a year, two years, three years, five years, it's like, I know that I can spend X and get a number of leads. Mm -hmm. And now I believe in what we do enough. I know that our process is good enough to be able to generate results where I can go, I can probably just spend some money on and generate more leads and I can call them. And Mm -hmm. I believe in what we do enough to be able to have a conversation. And, you know, probably anywhere from 50 to 100% of them will want to do something more with me after I speak to them about it. Mm -hmm. And now that I've done that for so long, I just believe it to be true Mm -hmm. because it's been, it's what we've done to grow. And like, you know, because it is true. Yeah. That's why you believe it because it is now a truth. Whereas 10 years ago, it wasn't a truth because you hadn't proven it. So, exactly. you, so you had doubts because yeah. it wasn't a truth, right? Whereas that's where now the imposter syndrome and stuff comes into play. Right. And that's like, the, the, to, to be honest, what got me over was I joined a mastermind at the time mm. with the last like dollars that I had. And it was literally, it's like, can you spread this over three credit cards? Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, well, it was like $500 on each card or something like that. And that was me maxed. Mm. And I was like, cool, now I'm gonna try and run some ads. Luckily, Facebook will give you like 500 bucks before they bill you. So mm-hmm. I was like, I'll run some ads, get some leads. So I did that and then I spoke to them and then they're like, I was like, I don't know what to charge them. So I asked my mentor at the time and he's like, well, um, I charge people 10 grand a month. And I'm like, this just sounds, that's very expensive. That sounds very hard. And I was like, well, what if I just tell them it's four grand a month, two grand at the front and two grand after I help you generate the results. So $4,000, but you can spread it out. And I was like, if he's charging 10, surely if I have a problem, I can just ask him. And he's charging people 10 grand. Mm. So he can give me the 10 grand a month answers Mm -hmm. to my four grand a month client. And I should be able to get the problem solved. Hmm. So I was like, Worst comes to worst, I can just ask him and say, hey, like, what do I do here mm. to fix this if there's a problem? And luckily for me, it just like, uh, I followed the framework that he taught me, put my own creative juices on it and mm. it started to work. So I never had to ask him that question, but in the back of my mind, every time I set a price, I was like, well, my mentor tried just 10 grand. So mm. like, if there's anything, I can just go ask him and get feedback from him. Mm. So in my head, I was just justifying it being like, cool, you, you Kim don't believe that your services are worth four grand. This guy's charging 10 and he's kind of helping you anyway. Mm. So like that, that should be okay. Mm. And I was like, yeah, it's like if you're getting your car serviced by the same servicing dealer that does Ferraris and they're doing your Toyota, mm. surely that like that will pass across. Yeah, and it's gonna yeah. work. So I was like, I'm just gonna roll with that and just see how it goes. And it's like the first client worked, next client worked and then just kept doing it until the point where I, then I was like, okay, I believe now that I can do this without having to lean on them too much. Mm. It's really interesting. Um, I'm doing a presentation up in Sydney in a couple of weeks at Dale Beaumont's Business mm-hmm. Blueprint event and I'm doing a four day masterclass and the last session is all about beliefs. And I, I saw this great quote by Sheryl Sandberg recently, COO of Facebook, for those that don't know, ex Google, just really influential, impactful woman in Silicon Valley and having a great impact on the world. I think I'm a big fan. Um, she's got a great book, great book called Lean In, I think mm. it is. Um, anyway, her quote is talking, so it's specifically about OKRs, which are a framework that we use here in the business to manage um, everyone's goals. OKR stands for objectives and key results. That's a whole other conversation we can have another time. But she says about uh, talking with your team about OKRs, she says talking changes minds, which changes behavior, which changes institutions. And I'm really down this rabbit hole at the moment of exploring how the thoughts that you think lead to the actions you take. But sometimes the actions you take can change the thoughts that you think. And I'll give you an example. If I'm feeling a bit lazy with exercise, my wife and I will quite often say to each other, just put your runners on. So I could be dressed in like what I'm wearing now, but I go to the hallway cupboard, I get my runners out, I put my runners on, 
and all of a sudden I'm going for a run. Mm. And I look at the rest of me and I'm like, well, shit, I better change my clothes and actually put my shorts and my T-shirt on because now I'm going for a run because I've just put my runners on. Mm. Whereas 30 seconds ago, I was like, I'm just going to sit on the couch and watch Law and Order Special Victims Unit with Mariska Hargitay because <laughs> that's my happy place. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, but now I'm going for a run because I've got my runners on. And you don't watch Law and Order with your runners on. You go for a run when you've got your runners on. So sometimes actions can actually change the thoughts. And it sounds to me like just doing the thing enough and proving that it works now gives you the confidence that I can bring someone else on on the team because I can just go make more sales and bring on a more client because I know we've got this process that actually delivers results. Mm. And it's all be at the, because a lot of people, if you ask them and like they know me long enough, they're like, cool. If you tell Kim a process to follow, he will do it and follow it. And I think that's the, literally the only thing that was good because the same for like, for me to get into university to everything else, I said, cool, what do I have to do? Mm to do this, what's the path? Mm. And I don't go step one, two, 10, nine, four, three. Like I'm just gonna call, I'm just gonna follow in sequential order. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of people and then they go, oh, you have to be kind of smart to do this or anything like that. And it's like, look, sometimes there are creative aspects to what we all do. But most of the time, if we follow instructions, mm. you're gonna get that. Literally all my family will be like, Kim, I just bought a new iPad or I've got <laughs> a new TV. Can you come and help with this? And I'm like, cool, <laughs> I get there. I'm like open the instruction booklet, Dude, follow the right. instructions. 100%, <laughs> I'm the same. Yeah. Like all my, all my friends are like, there's the box and it's full of all these amazing goodies and I'm reading the manual for like 10 or 15 minutes before I touch anything. And my friends are like, "Dude." How do you like, don't you just dive straight in? I'm like, why would you do that? Like five yeah. minutes of planning and I'm gonna have this thing nailed in like 10 minutes, it's yeah. easy. Otherwise you end up with the Ikea, like you end up with this and the feet are on the top and yeah. they're back to front. And, and you've got some like, spare screws. I'm like, I'm not really sure where yeah. these go. Just don't touch it, this just is a load read, bearing Read one. the manual. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know this because, so here we go, a uh, moment of radical transparency, right? When you, so you're a member of Mavericks Club, our mm -hmm. mastermind, and when you joined Mavericks Club, I was like, holy shit, Kim Barrett's joined Mavericks Club. Um, like, what's he gonna learn from us, right? And when you came to our event recently in Melbourne, I remember I remember thinking, I was nervous to have you in the room, right? Because I just look at what you're doing and, and like I've known your name for a long time and I was like really nervous about having you in the room. And yet you were the one dude that was like, your notebook was full of notes. You were like fully engaged in the process, following all the, the activities. I was just blown away at how committed you were to the process, even if like, a lot of that stuff you might already be doing in the business, you were kind of like fishing for the one or two nuggets that you might be able to pick up. And you were really diligent and just engaging in all the activities. And I was really impressed with, if, with, with how committed you were to the process. Yeah, and I think because a lot of people go into things and they're like, oh, I need something grandiose from something. It's like, normally, if you just follow the path, it's like you're gonna mm. find one little thing. Mm. And that's what I always noticed whenever I was reading any books on personal development or anything, it's like, cool. Many things, it's like I've heard it somewhat before, mm. but if I can just go, cool, I'm just gonna learn and see, because I'm gonna get something. Mm. Like, guaranteed, there has to be something in there. Mm. Even if someone just gave you something of someone else's, it's like you're still going to get it if you go in with the, the mindset mm. or an opportunity going, I want to get something from this. Yeah. But if you go in something and you have a closed-minded belief about it and it's like, cool, if you believe that you're going to fail in business, you will fail in business. 100%. And I think it's like there was a, there's a great um, Will's Wisdoms, Will Smith, and there's a video and he's like, and he quotes someone else, but he the one I always remember, and I forget who he quotes, so um, don't, I'm not Jay Shetty by any means, but please, <laughs> like I'm just using this, but he's like, he who thinks he can and he who thinks he can't are both right. Yeah, that's right. So it's like, cool, if I'm going to go out at something, it's like, I'm just going to go out at least believing that I'm going to, I'm going to hit it out of the park. Yeah, because it's like the worst case that happens is like, cool, I don't. But it's like at least if I believe to, I've got more of a chance that it's, something's going to happen, right? Yeah, and it's really interesting. I was talking to Dave Foy about this, who we did a course with last year, and you know he's quite well known in the kind of WordPress web design space. I'm pretty well known in that space as well. We partnered up to work on a course. I flew out to London to go to this event. We shot the course while we we're out there. Uh, we uh, hired an Airbnb. Uh, he came and stayed with me at the Airbnb. He knocked on the door, I opened the door. I'm like, dude, this is weird. Like meeting you in real life is just awesome. How you doing? We got on, we just clicked straight away. We shot the course, went to the event. After the event, we debriefed and we both admitted that we were both really nervous about working with each other. Mm. But you wouldn't have known it from an outsider. We just looked like we were best friends. But afterwards we were like, yeah, well, we both felt a bit intimidated working with each other. And he said something really interesting. He said, you know, every time I feel like I'm on the edge of the cliff, I know that's exactly where I'm supposed to be. Mm. And I think that that belief is like building a business is hard. Achieving anything worthwhile is freaking hard, right? Yeah. It's gonna take work. 
If you believe that you're going to fail, it just makes it harder hmm. to do it. If you believe that you are going to succeed, it's, it's still going to be hard and you're still going to have to confront all your fears, but at least you're giving yourself, at least you've got a little champion inside going, yeah, come on, man, you can do this. You, this is going to work. You can succeed. Whereas if you just listen to the voice of doubt, you're not going to get out of your bloody deck chair, man. It's just going to be so hard and it's just debilitating. And if you can just embrace that fear of feeling like you're on the edge of the cliff and know I'm alive, man, I'm on the edge of the cliff. This is exactly where I should be because this is where growth happens on the edge of that comfort zone. I know it's a cliche, but cliches are cliches for a reason. Yeah, right? and that's what the whole thing is. Like if you stay in your comfort zone, you will only get comfort. And it's that's like, right. cool, you know, yeah, that yeah. You're, you're never gonna stretch. And I think especially in business, I'm much more likely to take a risk in business than anywhere else. And it's like, I went to, um, one time I went to an event and I was speaking at an event in Bangladesh. And so wow. when I was like, okay, cool, I'm going to an event in Bangladesh, great. These guys, my friends, they invite me to come along and they got me on as a speaker and I was like, this is gonna be awesome. And I was like, at the time, having a few struggles in my business and then they're like, cool, there's actually been a terrorist threat. It's a red alert now in Bangladesh. All US citizens are being encouraged to leave. We're still going to run. Um, and Kim, now that you've booked your flights and you paid for your own flights, their flights were getting paid for, we think we actually won't go. And I'm like, guys, I literally just booked my flights to go and now you guys aren't going. And so it ended up being like, it was a husband and wife. The husband was, I'll go with you and we'll both go speak. We get there, the night we arrive, there is a terrorist attack. There's an insurgent thing. There was like bombs being thrown. I get picked up with a dude with AK-47 as I jump off the plane. I'm sitting here going, Oh, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. This is, this is where, this is where it all went. And I'm just, as soon as I could, I was like trying to speak with an Australian accent. I was like, someone get me a bloody boxing kangaroo. Because I was like, I am not American, guys. I love cricket, Ricky Ponting. Like it's all good, right? No, like not American. All with Americans. And I was like, oh, this is a stitch up. But when I was there, I was like, cool. This is the scary stuff. Yeah. And I was like, this is the stuff that's, and it's like in business, I was like, what am I been worried about? Like mm. literally it's like, and luckily we're in a world where it's like, cool, if we, if you fail in business, you can just start another one. Yeah. You can do it again. So as long as you don't do anything that's like negatively impacts people, but if you try something and it doesn't work, mm. you can get up again. It's like, if you in a world where there's terrorism and bombs going off, mm. something doesn't work there. Mm. You're up a creek without yeah, a paddle there. That's like right. that's that's the real fear and stuff. And I was like, okay, now that I had that experience and felt that, and it's like, cool, you're on lockdown. It's like you can't go in the pool because they're 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 uh, using the bomb detector in the pool at the moment and oh all this sort of God. stuff. And then they're like, oh, and great. And then the guy who's going to come and speak is the president's son, so he's not coming to speak because they think it's going to be attacked. But the terrorists don't know that he's not coming now. Oh right. So of course it's like, and it's like, so you guys just want to get up and do your presentations, and I'm like. This is the truth. I'm in a room of people full, and because we were white people, mm. they don't see the many there. They mm. packed all the people into the aisles, and afterwards, it was literally it's like you see what happens when Gary Vee goes and speaks. Mm. We were like mobbed by people, and they wow. were like taking selfies with us. And I'm looking at the wall as people taking selfies of me and stuff. And I was like, if anything is ever going to happen, it's going to happen right now. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that was that's fear. Get and I was like, yeah, yeah, I was like, wow. I'm gone. Wow. And so from that moment on, I always think now in business is like. Is this as as scary as that experience? Yeah. It's like, no, not really. Yeah. So I was like, and you know, and like I think if you can push yourself into those, not necessarily go into a terrorist. No. <laughs> but like push yourself into experience. I went and did like the cage of death in Darwin where they drop you in a cage with crocodiles and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, if you do stuff like that, that is like and you can see what that's like. Same as like bungee jumping, like any adrenaline based stuff, you're like, okay, cool. I actually am scared when I'm doing a bungee jump that the yeah. cable's not gonna catch my feet. I'm free falling at the yeah. moment or something like that. That is like fear and scared, like being scared. It's like in business, it's like, ah, oh, launch an ad, see if it works. Oh, that's cool. Like run a course, see what happens, how many sales I get. That's all right. Yeah. Like put on an event. Yeah, it's yeah. only a bit of money. It's like yeah. now it's like when you have those things, it's like. Puts it in perspective. Yeah. You're like, okay, all right. That's, I know what it's like now. The thing is too, that you said this before, if you, if you launch a business and it fails, you can just start again, mm. <laughs> which is easier said than done. Yeah. But the other thing is that once you've launched a business and you got to a certain level of success, if it does fail, like I, I say this to the team here and, and to my wife, if this all burnt down tomorrow, mm. I'd just start again. Yeah. And it wouldn't take me anywhere near as long to get back to where we are now because I've already done it. Yeah. I know what it looks like. It would probably take me a tenth of the time because I know the mistakes not to make. Yep. And my knowledge base and my knowledge bank now is much greater than it was 
you know, eight years ago when we started. I think that's the most important thing is that the other thing that I did probably to the detriment of us for the first three years is invested in a ton of knowledge. Mm. Like everything that I could mm. was buying. And like when you said like join uh, Maris Club, it's like, cool, if I get one thing, it's worth the investment. Mm. Cause I've in some some years previously, I've spent like 120 grand in a year mm. on like three different masterminds, events, courses, programs. And literally if there's, if I get an email and there's something good in the email, mm. I'm like, Oh, I just, I just, just one more. Like it's just, I just need another one. You yeah. know, it's like my girlfriend does it when she goes shopping, comes home with bags. It's like me. She's like, "What did you buy?" It's like oh, the only thing I get is emails. Yeah, like yeah, with yeah. Course, course access. Yeah. <laughs> she's like with bags, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah I probably spend more than you, but you just don't know because it's all. <laughs> don't look in my email courses folder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The wardrobe's empty, but yeah. my hard drive's full. <laughs> exactly. They're yeah. like, it's like Kim, you don't, you don't spend much on yourself. And I was like, oh, you guys don't know yeah, yeah. about all the things. And it's like that's just seven forty-seven, nine seven, one ninety-seven. It's like oh, I do this. They give me three payment plan option I'll just buy that yeah <laughs> easy it's like because I'm addicted to that side because as you said it's like if you invest in yourself and the knowledge that you have yeah it doesn't matter what happens and I think that's why it's like if, if I but again at the beginning I would have been like oh if this fails I'm, I'm screwed because I didn't have all the knowledge yet and now mm. that I do and I can continually invest in that knowledge mm. it's like cool if I get one little piece then it's like cool I can figure out how to turn that into ten thousand hundred thousand a million dollar idea from mm. there a uh, couple of things I want to talk about. Um, you've interviewed some pretty amazing people mm. uh, in person. Um, you've also had you've brought out some great people to Australia. Gary V. Um, you had a recent interview with um, uh, the sales guy Grant Cardone. Yeah. Um, how do you get on the? I mean, I'm completely selfishly asking right now. How do yeah. you get on the radar of people like Grant Cardone and Gary V. And how do you get them to to you know get on the podcast or get them in person and interview them or put on an event with them? How does that even happen? Well, so the um, uh, all transparent Gary V. event was coming out for someone else, but they needed someone to help market, and I was hmm. known to be marketing events. Hmm. So it was actually another guy who got the gig to market it, and he's like. I don't know how to market this event. Hmm. He's like, who do I know? And he knew me. So he brought me in to market it. And then I got to meet Gary and hang out with him and stuff like that, which was really cool. So being known for being able to fill events with Facebook ads was kind of one thing that I had Hmm. up my sleeve, which got me that. Now on the other side was Grant Cardone was again, one thing that I think a lot of people aren't willing to do. Like I said before, a few things that people just go like, I just follow instructions. Mm -hmm. Number two, I'm like, cool. Well, I wonder who, so Grant put up a post. And so did Michael Lane, who was bringing him out, saying um, Grant wants to interview, or wants to do interviews, wants to get known in Australia. And I was like, I wonder how many people will actually message Grant about this. So I messaged, emailed Grant, found his email, emailed his assistant, emailed Michael Lane, Instagrammed Michael Lane, Instagram Grant Cardo, and did is like just hit every single one. And then I got a message back, being like, Oh, hey. Like, tell us more about what you do. And it was actually the very first episode of my podcast. I've had a podcast previously. Mm -hmm. And I have a Facebook page where I run a lot of video ads. So I was like, look, I actually have three podcasts because we actually had an old one, a one that we, myself and Charlie uh, Valor used Mm -hmm. to do. And then I started a new one. I was like, I'm going to feature on the new one. I'm going to put it on my social channels. It's like, I pretty much will guarantee you'll get at least 50,000 views because I'm going to pay for marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll come to anywhere you are in Australia. And I'll do the interview because I'm coming from Perth. We are the most isolated. And I was like, played a little bit of a sob. Most isolated capital city. No one ever comes to Perth. Yeah. So like, I'll come and I'll meet come you. To you. Yeah, yeah. Wherever, wherever you guys are, as long as you can make it happen. Huh. Comes back and it's like, oh my god, that's amazing. So good. And luckily as well, had decent followings on Instagram and stuff also. And then I was, then I was like, I'll just come to wherever you can. And then they're like, cool, you need to come here. And I was like, great. And then I heard nothing from them. And I was like organizing a video team to try and meet me there to go and record because it was going to be in Brisbane. I'm from Perth. Mm. My team, I was like, I can't fly them over when I don't know when it's going to happen. So I have to get someone local. Mm. Managed to find out and they go, cool, here this time. So I booked someone to come film it and then got in there. But Grant did like 15 interviews while he was in Australia. Mm. Uh, Probably five of them were people that had never done a podcast or interview before. Wow. But they got it because they just were willing to ask for willing it. Willing to ask. Yeah. And then he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And he's like, <clears throat> he's like, albeit, I didn't actually know that half of them hadn't done a podcast before, but they booked it. He's like, I'm willing to pay my dues and, and do it. Mm. But they're just the people that asked. Mm. Like I, all I did was willing to go, hey, can I do this? Mm. And then they were like, yep, cool. As long as you can kind of like back it up with some stuff. Great. But no, like, and everyone's like three people messaged me going um, when they saw me get it. And, I, and they're like, how did you do it? I was like, I just asked. And then mm. they're like, cool, can you like tell me who you emailed and what you did? I was like, just do this. All, th- uh, all three of them got interviews as well. Wow. So they all managed to pick them up because they were like, what did you do? And I was yeah. like, I just did this. And they go, 
because most, most people make the assumption that they're going to be too busy. There's going to be like thousands of people asking, so I'm not I'm not going to ask because I'm not going to get. It's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. If you don't ask, you don't get right. Yeah, and it's the same. I always used to see these like things at school, and like when I was at school, well, I went to um, was in the student council, and then we had like head boy, which is like kind of leader of the school, I will, mm-hmm. if you will, from the student perspective. Yep. And I was like, great. I was like, what do I have to do to become the head boy like where you got to be in the council for two years so you got to get that year 11 and year 12 um and then if you do that you can become then i was like cool and then how do i become head boy like you need to get votes from all the rest of the people so i was like cool i just need to make friends with everyone and then hopefully they vote for me right and they're like yeah made friends with everyone and then um i was the only person in the history of the school i don't know if it's been since that got 100 percent of the votes meaning even the other guy voted for me as well (laughs) and i asked him after i was like you, you would you should vote for yourself I voted for myself because I want to win mm. and he's like no no I thought we couldn't so I voted for you <laughs> so everyone including him voted for me and I was like cool it's just because I found out like what's the path that I need to take follow yeah. the instruction and it's yeah, like yeah. works yeah yeah but I was willing to ask because he didn't ask what has to happen he's just like oh it's based on merit or something else and blah blah blah. and I was like no what has to happen it's like everyone's going to vote for you I was like cool I'm just going to make friends with everyone mm. and if I make friends with everyone this has got like a 50 50 chance they're going to vote for me hmm. if i'm not if i'm hopefully nicer than the other guy then i'll win uh i want to loop back to a conversation we were having earlier about your general manager that you mm. you've got yeah how what have you had to do mentally to let go of control i'm assuming that you have mm. uh so that the general manager can start to run things while you are you know over here going to marie folio events running your mastermind in brisbane you know interviewing grant cardone in brisbane all that kind of stuff the general manager's running the day-to-day operations. Mm. Has that been a scary thing to let go or has it been a gradual thing? How's that work? Yeah, uh, a, a bit of both. Like at the very beginning, it was hard because it's like I still want to keep my fingers in all the pies. Mm. But like we were saying earlier, and you're like, oh, what's some of the like, when you, when you get uh, older in business, it's like, cool, I need to get wiser. I need to focus on more of the boring stuff now, mm. which is like cool systems, like strategies for growth, long-term, like play-by-play type stuff rather than trying to be and do everything and I quickly realized it's like I'm good at some things um, and horrible at the other so I'm radically transparent with myself going cool I know where I suck and it's like great it's like I'm really good at marketing I'm really good at their creative direction on on that side of things and identifying the opportunities and I'm pretty good at building relationships with people from I can figure out and creatively think of like systems for us to implement but then when it comes to the implement implementing of the system it's like, cool, like, you know, time tracking, great. It's like, now that I'm running the business, like, I don't want to time track. Yeah. So I'm probably not the best person to implement the time tracking, like, area that's going to be handed over. Yeah. And I find that myself going, cool, just being honest and going, what areas am I bad at? Mm. And just focusing on the areas that I'm good at. Mm. And we, everyone in the team, they know, it's like, cool, my strengths are in these areas. And it's like, yes, like, if I'm going to manage, I'm going to micromanage. So it's probably not a good idea for me mm. to do that to give my team, like, the freedom and the flexibility that they need but I can do leadership pretty good. Mm-hmm. So if I can do leadership, I'll hand over the management so she can just do the management, which is like the day-to-day, the more the, and she's pretty good at being flexible with them and how they operate. Mm. Um, whereas me, I'd just be like, oh, like, do you put a dot on top of that eye? Like, <laughs> go on the T as like a cross like that? Come on, what are you doing? And, so. and how has she found it? Has she found the confidence to be able to push back on you and kind of tell you to stay out of the way or is that still evolving that relationship? Um, it was evol- like it took her a while. So she basically she used to be um, uh, executive assistant at an accounting firm as well. Funnily enough, mm-hmm. um, and she got uh, EA of the uh, runner up EA of the year. So she was really good already. Mm. She came in, started as office manager, and then transitioned to general manager. And I was like, cool. She had to get really, I'd say, from me permission. And I was like, you have permission to call me out and everything. And it's like, and I said as well, I will never challenge your decision. Yeah. Like if you make a decision in front of everyone and you make a call, that's I, like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm back. I back you 100. percent And that's only because a mentor of mine told me it's like yeah. you can never, if you have a manager, you can't ever challenge that decision right. because then everyone's like, well, then you're the manager. That's right. And then everyone's like, well, who's my boss? Yeah. I'm like, right. and I was like, it's not me. I was like, and then I even said, I was like, cool, Christy, like you're, you're my boss. You talk, like, yeah. she's like, Kip, like. You, are you going like when you go to Melbourne? Are you doing podcasts? Like, what are you doing over there? He's like, are you gonna like? So yes, like yesterday I went and did a podcast. Today I'm here, yeah. and she's like, cool. Like, are you like, you know, are you, are you making friends with Troy? You better be making friends with Troy. Like, what about <laughs> the guys? Are you gonna meet these guys? And I'm like, 
oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do all those things. Like, and so she's now knows my strength and she pushes me towards those. Mm. And then we'll have like, uh, and then I'll just every now and again be like, cool, here's an idea I have on how you can do even better in this area, how you can call me out on things, or as well, like here's areas where I did something and I realized I shouldn't have, and I want you to be able to say, you, you have full permission to go, Kim, that's stupid. Yeah. Or most of the time it's as well, it's like going back to me buying all the courses. I'm like, you. Uh, so now it's like, she has the company card mm-hmm. and I have to be like, can I please buy this thing? And she's like, what do you need it for? Like we literally <laughs> went and bought this podcasting equipment. And then she's like, she was out of the office and she took the company card. So I was like, I went and bought it myself. And then I was like, put in a thing for like reimbursement. And then she's <laughs> like, well, it's called the Kim Barrett show. So should, uh, isn't that a Kim Barrett expense? It's not really a your social voice expense, is it? And I was like, she still hasn't approved Ouch. it yet. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully when I get back, she approves uh, it so I could get reimbursed. Um, talk to me about the doing client services and helping your clients grow. What's the most rewarding part of the business model that you've got at the moment? The most rewarding, and I think I saw like in some of the um, the Mavericks Club stuff, it would probably be similar for yourself, is like when when people, like you give them something and they go and implement it themselves and get the result. Because I know every day what we can do and what we're capable of but when I share like our system with someone and then they post up like we had a girl the other day she's like cool close my first um, 10 grand client and then someone else is like oh Kim we um, we did a ba- I have this uh, model for people beta testing courses where they sell it before they before mm. they build it um, she taught them this model they made like eight grand on this girl's birthday and that's when they mm. did all the sales and I was like to me it's like I had no and I say to them it's like I had no impact on that mm. like I didn't do any of the work but because you followed it and you did it yourself it's mm. like I, I absolutely love that and we're very much when we're like teaching people how to do stuff one of my um, other mentors once told me it's like cool take no credit but then also take no blame yeah so it's like I'm not going to take any blame if you don't do it and I'm not going to take any credit if you do it so mm. every time I put a post I'm like I take no credit for this mm-hmm. but here's what people have been doing yeah and I'm just giving them like a celebration and a round of applause and it's like when I see that it just makes me so happy or then we also work with a lot of agencies Facebook agencies as well they come to us to get better and then one of them's like oh yes I got uh he's like I my client I got him 24 leads for two bucks a lead and I was like man that is amazing it's like I am like so far removed from that outcome mm-hmm. but I was like that's so cool I'm gonna can I screenshot and tag you and tell people who what you who you're working with and stuff and he's like yeah yeah please mm-hmm. so like that to me just makes me super happy and it's like we didn't have impact but we we're like we had impact from a distance yeah and I on. love that and it's just so cool when you see those things pop up yeah because you've got the the done for you agency doing client services you've also got the DIY kind of online course and you've also got the mastermind which is like the done with you model yeah, yeah. what's your what's your favorite one of those Oh, oh, it's really hard. Uh, <laughs> Depending on who's watching. Yeah, exactly. Um, at the moment, I would say like the the course and the mastermind, just because again, because it's new and it's like the yeah, yeah. you know it's the shiny object for me at the moment. Yeah. But um, like we're getting into some really cool. When when does this come out? I'll see if I can tell you some of the. Uh, this will be early November. Okay, cool. So hopefully it will be after our mastermind event. But so it's like we um like we're getting access to people who are like there's a guy who wrote a book. I got the book for all the guys in the mastermind, and I'm getting him to jump on, and he's gonna like call into our first day. Mm. And to me, like getting the that his booking in, and he's like normally I charge people, but because you gave my book to everyone, mm. I'll call in for free. And I'm like this is so exciting. I can't yeah, wait to yeah. talk to him. And then for everyone to see everyone's expression when they're like, and it's like and here's the author of the book. And I was like yeah. that that is just like super exciting to me at the moment. Um, awesome. And uh, especially because as well we're doing. And we're, we're, this is going across all areas, but we're doing a lot more um, strategic gifting, mm-hmm. which is also very exciting for me. So mm-hmm. it's like building relationships. There's um, two books, uh, Never Lose a Customer Again, and then also Giftology. And they, t- they tell a whole bunch of stories in there about how they've used um, strategic gifting in their businesses to grow over time. Mm-hmm. And after I re- like read both of them and read them again to make sure I got it right, I was like, this sounds really, really cool and I want to implement this across everything. And since we've started doing it, we've just noticed like a huge impact on how customers and clients and stakeholders are like relating with us. Um, And sometimes you don't, but it's like the one is when you don't, it's when it's the best because then it's like, we had someone come back to us from three years ago. He's like, he's like, do you remember when you sent this thing to me on my birthday? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I still remember that. And I still tell people about that. And I was like, but he never, I didn't even get a thank you back. Right, but I was like, oh, but it made an impact. Yeah, but it's, and so I was like, now it's also, but then it's hard to go. Oh, cool. I was like, when you know, when you give someone something, you're like, they should probably say thank you. You know, <laughs> you know? and it's like, no, no, I just give it to them. I don't. Expe- I'm not even expecting a thank you. I don't even want it. I'm gonna take no credit or blame if they arrived or not. Sometimes you're like, but you're like, can you just let me know it arrived so that I know that like, because if you don't yeah, get yeah. the tracking and you're like, yeah, and you order it from somewhere like in the US, you're like. 
Yeah. Does it come? Like, did yeah. it actually, did I, did I send it? Yeah. Like, uh, I got an invoice, did it go? <laughs> so it's always interesting. So never lose a customer and giftology. Yeah, All right, definitely. we'll definitely put links to those books in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, what are you most excited about over the next 12 months? Um, we've got a we got a big event on in February next year, which is like for oh, I say big event. It's 150 people. That's some big. for some like for me, it's like yeah. it's the biggest one that we've personally done. Like I've been involved in some big ones from other people mm. and help coordinate and help market and fill them. But doing it ourselves is pretty mm. cool. And it's also an event where that I'm doing that I don't have to speak the whole time at. So I'm also pretty excited to be like pretty relaxed because when you go in other people's events and you know come and speak at your events and mm. you would know going to others, you're like. What are the expectations that they have on me to perform, to do this, to do that? And because it's my event and my audience, I, I feel like I'm like, ah, oh, at least on the speaking side, the marketing side is a different question. But on the speaking side, I'm like, this is my audience. I can do whatever I want. Like I yeah, can rock yeah. up in board shots if I want to, because yeah. it's me. It's like, there's, you know, I'm the only one that's responsible for this. So it's pretty exciting to do that as our first kind of like foray into a bigger event for us. So that's, um, and it's at the very start of the year. So that's going to be exciting and see what happens after that. Awesome. Yeah. Well, dude, thank you for coming in and helping us christen the new studio here Pleasure. and being a guest on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Kim. All right, gang, uh, this podcast is, of course, sponsored by Kim Barrett at Your Social, Vo your Social Voice and the epic blog post that we've put together uh, on, on how to get more leads for your consulting business using Facebook ads. So check out the link underneath this video and check out that blog post and get on over to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe to the WP Elevation podcast. I look forward to speaking with you again soon on the podcast. Until then, I'm Troy Dean. Go Elevate.